Okay, but I become leader. I'd never heard about this, right? Because the FBI comes and just provides it to a select few people on Intel. So I ask for a briefing. Speaker, Speaker Pelosi comes and has this briefing with me. What I know with what the FBI told me, he should never be on Intel. And Pelosi reappointed him to Intel. I don't understand this. Did you, have you said this to her? Yes. <laughs> what, I what brought, she, what I, she but this is worse. I brought a motion to the floor to remove him from Intel, put another Democrat on. The Democrats all defended. They don't even have the briefing from the FBI, but they defended him having on. And think about this. He cannot get a security clearance in the private sector, but they voted to let him have the security clearance of American secrets. <laughs>
that they could tell us whatever we could. They could tell us where we could go to church. They could tell us where we could eat. I remember calling Gavin's chief of staff where he had, had just put out um, the restaurants could open based upon square footage who could be in there, but a church could never go more than 100. Yeah. So I talked to him, well, how do you determine the restaurant? Well, by square footage. Well, how do you determine the church? Well, not by square footage. Where's the science? But the only reason he started lifting anything is because of the recall. Yes. So what happened was democracy at work. It's the first time he started waking up, right? Tell us we couldn't do anything, but he's at uh, the French Laundry, right? All sitting together. You ever been to Fran French Laundry? No, I can't afford it. <laughs> you know they spent 20 grand on the bar bill? 20 grand on the bar bill. Is that legal? And he was with, he was with a bunch of lobbyists. He indoors. was with the, the Medical Association. Yeah. It was a birthday party. It's a birthday party. So what, what does California need to really turn around? Wh whether it's the recall or pushing Gavin to do some you know things as the recall sort of We need leadership. Yeah. We need simple leadership. And the challenge with Gavin is that most people that get into public service have a philosophy and a principle. And I, I admire that, even if the person has a different principle and philosophy than I do. Because you know where you could find common ground, right? No, but our government's not designed that one person gets 100% of what they want. So you, how do I keep my principles? How do I find common ground? And how do you move something forward? Gavin will change his opinion in a day. And he does it by a poll. Where do I need to move here? Where do I need to go there? Those are the people who fail in this process. And what I'm finding in this, he needs, here he is, a Democrat governor of the fifth largest economy in the world with Democrat majorities on both sides, and he's afraid to lead, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you lose all power when you're, not, when you're not leading. And think about what the Democrats, when they're looking for the presidential future, who's, their, who, who's the leader of the party? Gavin Newsom and Cuomo? And what they did, in the, what they did during COVID, and we got DeSantis and Kristi Noem that literally used their principles, not letting the federal government tell them what to do. I think the recall can pass, and I think it would be eye-opening for whoever could win the race. And remember, now that it's qualified, what's the first thing the Democrats did? Change the law. Ch yeah. Change, Change the, the law. law. And then they, they moved it up also, right? Yeah, because they think it's an advantage, because now that Biden is, is in and gave him billions of dollars, Gavin's going to buy his way out of it, or try to at least, yeah. right? So if you're low income and you have a moving violation, he'll pay for it, right? Here they are with everything heard about COVID, and they got $75 billion surplus. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And then he held money back from certain counties. But anyways, the last recall was about Gray Davis. And what happened in that process, people at the very beginning, they would pull and say, I don't want to recall the governor until they found out who would replace him. So I really think what California is looking at, to get to the recall, it wasn't a bunch of Republicans who signed it. It was independents. It was Democrats. And there was a lot down here. Why? They're concerned about homelessness, but really affordability. They want to go to work. I, I went to a bunch of the rallies. These were not Republicans. These no. were not conservatives. These were people, these were restaurant owners who just wanted to go to work. That's really what it was. They wanted to be able to live their life. I mean, who can't forget that one young woman who has that restaurant bar? Yeah. She, who's she, being she, shut down, but the Hollywood one gets to be I open right I was there with door. her. Yeah. So, if you lay the rules out and you abide by the rules, you should be able to carry forward. But that doesn't play in the Democrat California. They want to change the rules all the time. So what I truly believe, if people are engaged, we'll win this recall. What has to happen when you go to the vote, you get two questions. One, do you support the recall, yes or no? And then you vote for who to replace. You need one person to rise up to be the leader. And it, it doesn't have to be partisan. I firmly believe that will transfer and make sure the recall passes. So who's that person? Well, I don't know who that person is just yet. You but don't now know we know the is. date. We know so. the date. That's something. What's it like for you as a Republican congressman in this crazy state? Just, just going around as a conservative in blue California. You know what's interesting? If I'm on a plane and I'm flying to Florida, there's people want my autograph to applaud me. In Texas, they'll cheer me. Yeah, yeah. In California and New York, they'll yell at me, right? Yeah. But that's okay. That's okay. What's happening is, is, is something I haven't seen in quite some time. Look, in California, we've had Republicans and Democrats who have managed this state. And I firmly believe if we could change the top two system, I know why people want to put in the top two system. I never supported it. But the top two system takes us away from having a debate about ideas. 
So what's happening in the top two system, we're not getting the very best people to run. Because think about this. One of the most popular governors in the country is a guy named Baker in Massachusetts. He's a Republican. Mm -hmm. Do you know there's not one Republican congressman from Massachusetts? It's overwhelmingly Democrat, but they reelect this governor, Maryland, right? But what's happening in California, you're not getting the quality people to run because the top two people think there's not enough Republicans. But if we let the parties decide on at least all the constitutional offices, you would have a debate of ideas. And I, what I truly believe in California, people would want to check and balance. That the legislature is so far, it's not democratic, it's socialist, right? Mm -hmm. This wing has gone so far that they would want to check and balance that if they got out of control, they have somebody in governor who would veto the bill. I think a Republican could win governor each and every time in California. I think an attorney general Republican could win. Target closes their stores in San Francisco. Neiman Marcus, they just run it. Yep. And why? These are the Democratic policies that have now been implemented because they won the majorities. Now we're seeing the outcome. That is why the pendulum will swing. Why do you think Democrats can't seem to associate the people that they vote for and the policies they vote for for the bad stuff that happens? Like all the people in San Francisco right now that are watching the Neiman Marcus video that we, we played it on the show and just people running into Walmart and into Walgreens, I think 17 Walgreens closed in the San Francisco area, just stealing stuff and then you've got the DA that won't prosecute and then now we've got the former San Francisco DA is now in Los Angeles. I mean, you get it's the swamp, it's a mini swamp that we've got here in California. But for some reason, people can't seem to realize, oh, if you keep voting in the same party and things keep going wrong, that there's maybe a connection there to the people you're voting in? I Is think, it the sun? It's the, it's the weather, right? It fries, <laughs> it fries everybody. No, what, what, I, think, I think it's a combination. I don't think these are the Democrats of old. I mean, if you study history oh, I in know LA. It. I, I wrote the, the book. Yeah, <laughs> there, weren't, there yeah. were Democrats who weren't crazy. There were Democrats who were conservative, right? If you took Jerry Brown's father, if you compare Jerry Brown, who I think is liberal, compared to Gavin, he didn't. Mm -hmm. He seemed more conservative. But what what I found now is, they have they have shifted. They have become a socialist Marxist idea, and that wing of the party has become more powerful, and the moderate wing of the party is afraid, and they can't win anymore. Are, are you surprised how quickly they folded? That's one of the things I'm just focused on all the time. That they, I don't think in his heart of hearts that Chuck Schumer is a true like radical leftist, or yeah, he, or even Nancy Pelosi. I don't really think that he's afraid of him. No, yeah. He, P Pelosi Maybe is. she is. Pelosi yeah, is. okay, okay. But, but Pelosi actually gets... That, I say that with no love for her. That was like trying to give like a little bit of credit that I don't think she's like over the top AOC, but... You know what? They're afraid. She, no, she's jealous of AOC. She believes she was the founding liberal. She's from San Francisco. She's the found, And they... Think of this. Right. AOC has more followers than Pelosi. When AOC got elected to Congress, remember, she, she won, and I'll get the number wrong, she, she only won and only had to have like No, it was a tiny votes, amount of votes, right? yeah, yeah. But here she is, and she has a name brand, and she, she had more followers in Pelosi. She was giving Pelosi problems. So what did the Speaker of the House do? Had a meeting with her, and then took a picture. Yeah. You know who put the picture out? Not AOC, Pelosi. Because she believes AOC is stronger. And then look at this. In the last election, Pelosi saying she's going to win 15 seats. She got the number right, the party wrong. It's the first time since 94 not, not, no Republican lost, and we beat 15 Democrats. But the interesting part is there is only one wing of the Democratic Party that grew. She, Pelosi has a five-seat majority. The smallest has been in 100 years. But the Cory Bush, the AOC, the Tlaibs, the Omars, that wing, the socialist wing of the party, grew stronger. Mm -hmm. They won, and Pelosi lost. So how do you take the House back? Oh, we take the House back exactly what we did in the last election, okay? And you've got to analyze it. In the last election, had we not had COVID, Trump would have won re-election, okay? Any historical factor that you go through, pandemics, the leaders normally have a challenge. The Senate, we really thought Republicans would win. And think about that. You only needed one seat to win in Georgia. Right, you had two and you lost? Yeah. People could call malpractice on that, right? Because think about it. If you run, <laughs> you trying to get me booted from YouTube? No, no, no. <laughs> but if you run as a Republican in Georgia, you start with a four-point advantage. Yeah. Okay? In the House, everyone believed we'd lose 15 seats. Even our own, even our own pollsters thought we'd lose. But think about this. We win in 2010. We beat 63 Democrats. Not every incumbent wins. 
So in this last election, with all the wind against us, every single incumbent wins, but we beat 15 Democrats. Every Democrat lost to a Republican woman or a Republican minority. We elected more Republican women mm -hmm. than any time in the history of the party. Okay? So now, only two times in the history of the country has the party in power, meaning whoever controlled the White House, lose the White House and gain seats in the House. 1892 and 1992, and both times they won the majority two years later. Okay. 31,731 votes. That's how short we came up from winning the majority, out of more than 152 million. Hmm. So what, what really happened, there was about four or five seats. I didn't have enough money we didn't to play in, and we lost by less than two points. People didn't quite see what was happening at the silent majority. That's why when you talk about can we win the recall in California, yes. I don't care what the pollsters say because momentum. The next election is going to be big, right? Because all of these things about defunding the police, mm -hmm. they're all go all these Democrat policies that are now going in place, we're seeing the outcome, the wokeism, the open border, the inflation. Um, where we're going to have the biggest victory? School boards. We haven't been paying attention for the last 20 years. Critical race theory yeah. goes against everything Martin Luther King has ever told us. Don't judge us by the color of our skin. And now they're embracing it, right? They're going backwards. And the interesting part here is, OK, something else is happening, not just an election. And it'll be a national election for Congress. What history says is the party in power, whoever wins the White House on the first off-year election loses 27 seats. We lost 40. Obama lost 63. So that's, and they have a five seat advantage. Mm -hmm. In the last election cycle, we, we targeted about 50 Democrats. Only one retired, okay? This cycle, already five Democrats have retired. And I'll bet you that gets over 10. And why they're retiring is because you have redistricting as well, right? Redistricting doesn't affect the Senate, but it does the House. Almost every seat unless you go statewide. And what redistricting tells us is people move, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we've got this amazing ability, the states and the 10th Amendment, right? They're like pilot projects. They're, they're like startups, right? I mean, welfare reform didn't start in Washington, D.C. It started in Wisconsin. Some mm -hmm. of our best ideas are driven from the bottom up, not from the top down. And the Democrats love the top down, OK? So for the first time in the history of the state, California is not gaining a seat. We're losing a mm -hmm. seat. New York, Illinois, who gains? Florida, Texas, right? So what's going to happen here, people are moving based upon the philosophy. I believe it's going to be an interesting time because here the Democrats are going to be sitting back. They realize they're in trouble. They've been in office for a little while. Do they want to go have to meet new constituents and, and explain to them why they defend the, the message of Maxine Waters? Mm -hmm. Or why they aren't standing up to protect our borders? Or what are they doing economically but creating inflation? Why are they paying people more money to stay home than instead of go back to work? Why are they making our military woke? I think that silent majority is going to wake up. And I think there's going to be a pretty big swing. So the number one thing you have to have is the quality of the candidate. So what, what does the, the sort of next wave of Republicans look like to you? I mean, there is sort of this battle now. Is it going to be like the Trump wing, or is it going to be the more old school Republican wing? Is there some brand of that? Where does Trump fit into this? Well, I, look, this is the way I look at it. It's interesting within Trump, right? Because Trump did a couple different things. Um, he expanded the party, OK? So when people sit back and think, oh, I bet Trump really hurt you in the campaign. No, he didn't hurt us. Do you know what the best state for Republicans were in the last election? Statewide? Yeah. Well, if you're going to tell me it's California, my head's going to explode. It's California. Because, somehow, because what? Because just in we terms of. We gained four seats. Yeah. And, but put it in perspective Trump lost California by five million right. votes. Right. He didn't compete here. The four seats of the Democrats we beat, Trump lost all four. Three of them by double digits. So they go into the polls, and by more than 10 points, points they vote for Biden, but by more than 10 points, they reject the incumbent. Is that shocking to you? I mean, that, that's got to be close to unprecedented, that sort of disconnect between the top of the ticket. It's the quality of the candidate. Did you realize we won two seats in Miami? Mm. And this is a part you should really look at. Do you realize that the biggest border district in the country goes from El Paso to San Antonio? A guy by the name of Tony Gonzalez mm -hmm. ran, never been elected before, 
Trump endorses him, he wins the primary by seven votes, but he wins, it's a 70% Hispanic seat. He wins the seat, it wasn't even on people's radars because they didn't think we had a chance by a bigger margin than Will Hurd had won. Okay, in Miami, Maria Salazar, Carlos Jimenez. These are Democrat seats, but you know why we won? Because the population in those districts are made of, of Cubans and Venezuelans who understand freedom. They get it, they get it. They don't just get it, they left yeah. what they see happening on the Democratic side. So we grew in areas people haven't thought before. Now, the question was about what's the future look like. If you look at Trump's policies, the majority of Americans would agree with him. Personality is what got people at times to disagree with Trump. So if you separate personality from the policies, and here we are going into an election where contrast make elections happen, right? So here we have policies that we know we had low unemployment, everybody had a job, we looked strong around the world, we were energy independent, we had a secure border, within six months, what have you done? Yeah. I believe when th that debate is gonna be about policy, we're gonna win big. All right, so let's, let's shift from the everyday machinations of politics and talk, to, talk about the other big stuff that I know has been on your mind, it's on my mind all the time. Let's talk about the big tech stuff. We, we got some problems with big tech, and I know you're trying That's to figure out- That's the thing that can stop us from winning. Yeah, so, so let's talk about that. I mean, well, first off, I guess, how manipulated do you think we are first? Like, just More generally by big tech, like just the way that we're able to talk to each other and communicate. More than we ever imagined more than we even think about. Okay, you and I should have a discussion. Let, let's discuss your book. Don't burn this book. And when this interview's over, I'm gonna turn on my phone. I bet you I get an advertisement for it. Do I'm we, okay with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that. That one I'm okay with. But do we think yeah. Siri yeah, only yeah, listens listen. to us when we talk to him? But what's, what's even more important, it's almost every aspect of our lives, mm -hmm. right? But it's gathering what information we can know and what we can think and what we can see. But it's also driving us to dislike people even mm -hmm. if they think differently than we do. And you know, they'll tell you, no, 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 it's an algorithm. Who writes the algorithm? You know, in 2018, right before the election, if you Googled the California Republican Party, you know what they'd tell you our ideology was? Nazism. How is that even in play? Google and the, the, Are you saying it doesn't say it anymore? I'd be well, I'd be, I brought, I brought I'd be shocked if they, came, if they came around. Well, they probably brought it back up today. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But what's happening here from the aspect of 90% of everybody that searches goes on Google. Yeah. If you're on the second page, 90% drop off. So they control whether you make it or break it, right? But they also, if we are a young company moving up, they are so big they take your technology, they buy you, or they crush you, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have that free market system. You know, when you sit back and think, who should have been Amazon? Sears and Roebuck, right? They had the catalogs, they sold you from a house to the pair of jeans, to tools, they had the resource. But Amazon came in a time where there was a free market. They started selling books, they started doing mm -hmm. that. But now, Amazon's just not Amazon. Amazon hosts everybody. So if they want to take you off, you now can't be there. If Apple doesn't want to put you into the app, who finds you? Yeah. They control so much of our life. Well, think about it, if I grabbed your phone, you'd fight me. Yeah. <laughs> if you take your kid's phone away, it's the worst thing that could happen to them. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's almost a drug to us now, but it controls so much what we can see, what we can know, what we can hear. And if they disagree with you, they can take you off. If they don't like your competition, they can take you away. That's the problem. So what do you see as the answer? Is this we go in and we have regulators look at the algorithm? This is, you know, I always have this running joke that you're gonna have some middle management bureaucrat going to Google, like, let me see the algorithm. As if, or are we breaking them up? I mean, where does competition fit in? Like, what's the... This, this is the way I put it. The, the first approach we should take is, everybody should realize if something's on the internet that's free, you're the product, Yeah. okay? So if you're the product, we should think of ourselves as private property, right? So if I'm the product and we're private property, what goes on your site, if you're monetizing it, I get a piece of it. And I get to know what you're doing with my information, right? It's not like this form that attorney has to read, everyone just clicks yes or no. Let's set a foundation 
of what the priorities of these forms should be so they're clear spoken that people know what they're getting. I get, I get, if you're monetizing, I get a piece of it. If I want to get off your site, I get my data back. If I want to move my data, I can move my data. I think that's a fairness that everybody starts with. The other thing that has to happen here is though, we've got to make sure there's a level playing field where there's competition. And I don't think big government creating utility, is there competition for PG&E? No, they just raise our rates and they give us brownouts and we pay 40% higher than anybody else. I want somebody to come in and disrupt. I, I want the next one, right? We had Microsoft before we had Google. And the, the other challenge is, if somebody wants to go to the courts, it takes too long, right? So I understand at the beginning why we gave you Section 230, right? You wanted the platform to begin. Mm -hmm. I will keep 230 in only this perspective. If you let people say on the platform whatever they want, because it's liability protection for you to allow the people to do that. But, but is it too late? I mean, I've had this conversation with other Congress people and, and plenty of pundits late. and everything else. Like, it's like, well, why didn't anything happen then? When, when, when they dragged Zuckerberg in because, front of Congress, they dragged Because Section that. 230 is still there. Yeah. So if you remove Section 230, now, now the platform has a question to make. If I want to regulate what's on there, right. a person has a right to go to court. If we go to court one time, do a big class action, I'll guarantee you they'll change their behavior. Structure dictates behavior. Right now they're isn't that, protected. Isn't that what Trump is now announcing he's doing just in the last couple of days? So he's going to do a, a, a class action. think about it for right? one moment. Yeah. Regardless of how anyone feels about Trump, yeah. he had the most people on Facebook, probably the most followers on Twitter. He was the president of the United States. Our very first amendment is freedom of speech. And they took him off. And the place I heard the most complaints from was Merkel in Germany. I mean, think about it. Yeah. 32 years ago, a million college kids went to Tiananmen Square for the idea of freedom of speech. The three million people out of eight million in Hong Kong that would go out in the rain craved freedom of speech. And we had just allowed that to be denied to an American. And then once they did it to him, they did it to everybody else that they disagreed with. Why have we come so far that you and I can't could sit down, you could have a total different philosophy. We could debate, but we don't have to dislike each other. When we take away the debate, we're taking away a foundation of who we are. I mean, I should not be afraid that someone has a different belief than I and debate the idea. It either makes my idea stronger, makes me believe more. I mean, I'm a Republican, but my family are all Democrats. Hmm. I chose to be in this party. So when someone wants to challenge me on my conservative beliefs, I wasn't born here, I chose to come here. I think I'm going to have a stronger belief. I rejected what somebody said at home and s was seeking out something else. Wait, let's stick with that for a moment because I think you know a little bit about my story. Yeah. I, mean, I, was, I was a big lefty, so I, I'm curious. I didn't know that about you. So you come from a family of Democrats. What, what was, older. I was the first Republican in my family. What was your moment? Mm, so I'm older than you. We'll get back I'm to I'm 56. Well. Yeah. Reagan was the first president I could vote for. It, it, was, it was in his second term. But when I was in elementary school, I, I watched junior high. Jimmy Carter, go on TV, put a sweater on, tell me to turn the heater down and told me the best days of America were behind us. Yeah. He accept mediocrity. Then watch this other guy go to a podium and says, no pastels, fly the bold colors and go to that shiny city on the hill. I knew what he meant, right? That America is exceptional, right? If you, ever, if you come to my office, I want you to come to DC yeah, sometime. Yeah. So I have this portrait of Reagan behind me, it's in color, right? And I have this other portrait that's very big and it's Lincoln, and it's in black and white. The greatest challenge ever to our Constitution was the Civil War. And at night, if you sat back and what's happening, and you ask these two people to give us advice today, Lincoln would say, believe in the exceptionalism of America. And this is what makes me mad coming off the 4th of July. Why wouldn't we celebrate the progress? Mm -hmm. We're not perfect, but as we strive for a more perfect union. Lincoln said, conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that we're all equal. He goes on to say, but if we fail, government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from earth. We weren't the world power, but he understood the strength of what a democracy and republic were, right? There is no other nation in the world conceived in liberty mm -hmm. and dedicated they're all equal. Maybe Israel, but no other one, right? Lincoln would also tell us this, right? As an elected official, don't be afraid of making a tough decision, right? The whole debate of slavery didn't start in 1850. 
It was the creation of our country. But they thought it was too, too divided, too divisional, right? That it would divide us, divide the colonies. So they said to put it aside. In doing so, hundreds of thousands of their children died. We don't have a decision like that today, mm -hmm. but our debt, our challenge with China, right? Are we too afraid as elected official to make a decision that we can lose upon? But what happens is you narrow it, you're eventually going to make a decision, but you're going to have fewer options. And the other thing Lincoln would tell us today is, don't blame other people for your problems. Think about it. He gets elected November 1860, but not sworn in until March 1861. Never once did he blame Buchanan. He understood where he was. What was it, seven states left the Union in that short amount of time? Mm -hmm. Now Reagan, I have him in color. And this, was a, this is something for you, it's for something for every conservative. This is what he, and he'd even say it to liberals, right? If you believe in your philosophy, if you truly believe your philosophy and principles bring people more freedom, don't be angry, be happy. Mm -hmm. I, I get upset that these people say, oh, I'm more conservative because I'm angry. All that means is, less people want to have dinner with you. Yeah. Reagan brought Democrats in, right? People want to know what he was drinking. Why was he so happy? You know, he had the 11th commandment. He, he didn't tear another Republican down. He brought humor to it, but he knew his He was principles. basically in the Rat Pack. I mean, the guy was cool. I just yeah. watched a Rat Pack documentary. He's like, he's hanging out with Sinatra. Like, the, yeah. You wanted to be around him? Yeah. yeah. The other thing Reagan would tell us, and th this would be critical for the time and nature of who we are, peace without freedom is <clears throat> meaningless. Think about that. Peace without freedom is meaningless. It is human nature that we crave peace, but we cannot attain it without having freedom, okay? So, so many times in history we watched have people has failed, right? Chamberlain, peace for our time. What did he do? He claimed he created peace by appeasing Hitler, by giving him a country. Mm -hmm. All Hitler understood your weakness and I'm gonna beat you, right? Barack Obama, concerned about Iran, he gave them billions of dollars thinking they would, and then said you can have a nuclear weapon, you just have to wait 10 years. There, there was no freedom in that, so there was no peace. So they took that money and they funded terrorism around the Gulf. Reagan had the same dilemma. He's in his second term. He's sitting next to Gorbachev. He's in Iceland, right? And he's actually having no staff in the room, and he's negotiating a nuclear reduction. He's getting almost everything he asked for. But Gorbachev asked him for this. Gorbachev asked him to end the SDI program. But remember the time and place when Gorbachev asked him? It was a joke, right? People called it Star Wars. Mm -hmm. It is the Iron Dome today that shoots missiles down. It's what protects us. Reagan, you know what he does? He doesn't say, let me talk to Congress. He says, no, but I'll do something else. I'll share it with you so the world will be safe. Gorbachev declines. So Reagan has, here's a document that he got a lot of what he was asking for. But it didn't do anything for those in the gulags. It didn't do anything for Rekvoenza. Mm -hmm. So he realized there was no freedom in it, so there would be no peace. So he got up and he walked away. And there's this famous picture of him like in a raincoat going out rejected. Yeah, yeah. Every media, elite media, criticized him, right? But had he not, not walked away at that moment, the Berlin Wall would not have collapsed. The Soviet Union would not have collapsed. And, and what's interesting to me, in, in modern time, there have been two presidents that have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize, Jimmy Carter and Barack Obama. The two presidents who deserved it, really, were Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. What he did in the Abraham Accords yep. were amazing. But I thought we're not allowed to call them that anymore, right? Isn't that what the administration says there, the Middle East peace not really thing or something like that? Well, they're trying to tear them down. Yeah. You know? But this is the challenge. When you think about that, what drove me to this party? And I love, you know, we had a debate the other day on the floor to remove statues, right? Every state gets to send two statues. So the Democrats had a bill to remove these statues because these were Confederate individuals. So I go to the floor. I voted for the bill. I voted for it last time. I said, let me just get this straight. You want to remove Democrat statues that were sent to us by states that were controlled by Democrats years ago and sent to Congress that had a Democrat majority that accepted them. Well, I just didn't think the bill went far enough. Why didn't they change their name? Do, do you realize... Is that where this all ends? That It ends with the Democratic Party basically having to commit Harry Carey because it was who, who, pretty much them Who's the first? Who's the first Republican president? Abraham Lincoln. 
That's right. Yeah, because he left. He didn't want to be well. Yeah, the Whigs, the Whigs, and then they brought job. they brought the non-slavery Democrats. Yeah. yeah. And then what happened? Have you ever thought for a moment? If you're going to write another book, we should collaborate on this. Yeah. What would America look like had Lincoln not been assassinated? Malice towards none. Would we ever had Jim Crow laws? You know how Jim Crow laws came and who who authored Jim Crow laws? The Democrats. Yeah. How do they do it? Because after the Civil War, the South was controlled by Republicans. White Republicans and black Republicans. And who'd they elect? Black Republicans. Who's the first black American elected to Congress? It's a portrait in my office, too. Joseph Rainey. Where was he elected from? Charleston, South Carolina. If you, if you study American history, the Civil War started there, right? He was a slave. He was elected in 1870. Do you know when the first black Democrat was elected? 60 years later. But what happened, there got up to 23 Black Republicans elected. So we had a race for the presidency that was close. So the Democrats cut a deal with the Republicans that we'll go with you that you won if you do one thing. If you remove the federal troops from the South. Mm -hmm. So they removed the federal troops from the South. You know what happened? They intimidated now black Americans from voting who happened to be Republicans. And the Democrats took over the state houses in the southern states. And that's where Jim Crow laws were created based upon Joseph Rainey. Now you want to know a modern history? Who's the only black American to get elected to the House and to the Senate? House and Senate. Ah, Tim Scott. Is, okay. And do you know where he got elected to the House? Well, Charleston, South, South Carolina. Carolina. Okay, yeah. Huh. Isn't that something? But then they criticize him. Remember when he got up and gave a speech? Oh, yeah. It why is he a Republican? They ju why wouldn't you celebrate, regardless of a person's color or sin, their success? So what do you do with that? So right. So Tim Scott gives the the speech after the uh, State of the Union, and in effect, um, everyone's calling him a self-hating. Oh, you know, just all the worst Washington stuff. Post wanted to go after him. Yeah. If you know anything about Tim Scott, so Tim Scott's mother is a saint, right? She's an amazing woman. Tim Scott and his brother, his mom gets divorced, right? So they spend a lot of time with their grandparents. Every day they had to eat breakfast, and his grandfather had the newspaper out. And for years, Tim Scott has thought his grandfather was reading the newspaper. It wasn't until later in life that he find out his grandfather could not read. But what his grandfather was doing was instilling in his grandsons that you cared about current events. You cared about what was going on. You know, Tim Scott's family had to pick cotton. They had every reason to hate America, but they did not. Martin Luther King had reasons to hate America, but he did not strive to be that more perfect union. So as we hear people want to talk about what's negative about us, why don't we highlight what's right about us? Why don't we strive to be that more perfect union? Why do we tear somebody else down? You can have a different opinion than I, but the great thing about America, you have a right to say it. So it seems fairly obvious to me, and I think probably most of my audience, that most conservatives, let's say, or blue dog Democrats, or basically everyone non-woke agrees with what you just said there. We can agree to disagree, all right, you want this tax rate, I want this tax rate. Even on abortion, I, you know, in my book, I make a begrudging pro-choice argument. Most of my audience is conservative now, and mo you know what most people said to me? Dave, I disagree with you on that, but it's all good. And, and, okay, or they usually say you'll come around to my opinion soon enough, but, but they don't hate me for it. So the point is that on the right, there is plurality of opinion, but what do you do? I mean this for you personally, but also, but also professionally in what you do. What do you do with a group of people? AOC is not here to negotiate with you, obviously. Ilhan Omar is not here to negotiate with you or negotiate what America is. So what do you do with that? You know what's sad, though, too? Look, I, I respect them. Getting elected to Congress is not easy. And, and th think of Congresswoman Omar's life, right? Born in Somalia. It's, it's not an easy life. Lives in a refugee camp. But what does America do? She does what she does some of her greatness. She opens up her arms. She brings her and her family in and she becomes a citizen of America, right? And the moment she raised her hand and became a citizen, the flag that yeah. flies on the moon was her flag. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln was her liberator. Martin Luther King spoke of her dreams, right? She has as much right as you and I, but she has as much responsibility. But what strikes me to be odd, why does she have such negative things to say about the country that embraced her? That gave her. Think about this. Less than 13,000 people have ever had the opportunity to be a member of Congress. Not only did America bring her in, she serves. She, she, yeah. she decides the future of this country. Wouldn't you think, my God, this is the greatest thing on earth? So what do you do with that? I mean, as a member of Congress, what do you do when you look across the aisle 
And you, to me, I mean, maybe I can say what you can't quite say. I think they're here to burn it down. I, I think the simple answer to what you're saying is they don't want the America that you're talking about and the history. Well, they don't want the history you're talking about to they be don't taught. Want the we know that. If they want to change so, the names, if they if they right. want, if they want, look at CRT, the whole thing. I think everyone gets it. So then, w what do you do with that? This is not the Democrat that you Divi were across the division, aisle of twenty years ago. Division divides this nation. A house divided cannot stand, and that still stands today. We cannot allow that to happen. Um, I can respect you, um, but you cannot let them divide the people. And this is, this is what's happening on college campuses, right? I, I got a question from some interns the other day, what should I do? Even if you disagree with that person's, what they're saying, you should stand up for them. Don't let people be bullied. Don't let people try to have to have one to thank. But this is what's happening. And it's happened into our schools for quite some time, and now we're waking up. Um, it's now happening when it comes to media, when it comes to companies. They intimidate you, right? You can't give political, you can't have a political pact because you, you, you can't give to somebody um, in the process. We're going to boycott you if, if you don't boycott the, the baseball game mm -hmm. when you don't even know the facts, right? I mean, this is what has gotten so far and so wrong that these people, and now that we're trying to make woke into our military, I mean, look, we should respect people and the rule of law should live the day. That's one of the things that makes us strong, right? Eventually, even OJ gets convicted, right? I mean, th this is a challenge here that what they're trying to do to the nation. And study modern history. Think about what happened in Venezuela. Venezuela was a democratic country. It was the jewel of Latin America. Oil was at $100. Hugo Chavez got elected not because he had a revolution. He got elected in a democracy. And then when he got elected, what did he do first? He started saying, you know what? You should have free school. You should have free health care. And it costs a lot of money. So you know what? Government is more efficient, in his view. We should take over those companies. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The Supreme Court said no, that that's not legal. You know what? I should pack the courts. When they didn't let that, you know what? I'm going to change the Constitution, get rid of the entire Congress. And lo and behold, now I have a dictatorship. And why does everybody leave your country? Because the outcome. Just that the same idea as why you want to defund the police and what's Minneapolis want to do today? They want to put more money into it. But it's worse than that because now people don't want to be officers. Right, they're all retiring and, and you, you they don't want to You can't just bring it back place. on. Yeah. And then the outcome of what you're getting, people, people shouldn't have to serve time, so we just let people out. And then they've got homelessness everywhere. So, they're not so, getting treatment. So are we at sort of an intractable place then? I mean, one of the things I've been thinking about is that maybe we really, I don't want the country to break up, obviously, but maybe that we really do need parallel economies, sort of linking this back to the big tech argument, and, and that there will be woke things, and then there will be the rest of us, and we will build our things, and they will build their things. And I don't know where the political piece of that you know, fits totally. Listen, government is not designed where somebody gets 100% of what they want. You've got to find common ground. What sets the part from every other country? You go to France, you become a citizen, you're not French. So we're the only country mm -hmm. that you assimilate and you become yeah. one. And that's some of our greatest strength, right? And you are equal. It doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, gay, straight, whatever you are, you're equal here. That sets us apart from every other nation because they're not like this. You can't let them divide us. It's not, it, 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 it will harm us in the long run if we're divided. Now, can we have difference of opinion and respect one another? Yes, you can. But the idea of trying to divide people um, is going to break us. And I've, I've watched that where there's the intimidation of make it happen, to try to make that happen. And that's where leadership comes in. Remember what Winston Churchill said about us, right? You can always count on Americans to do what's right after they exhausted every other option. Mm. And we always think it's the worst of times, right? No. In the 60s, they killed JFK. They killed Bobby. They killed Martin Luther King. There were riots all in the streets. We were much more divided then. We know the right thing to do. What's happening is the division is creating people to dislike people more, to attack somebody based upon their beliefs. People come to your houses. People intimidate you from that. That is what we should all stand up against. So is that just because it's fueled by social media now? Right, because if you think back to the 60s, it was incredibly divided, as you said. I mean, there were at least three massive assassinations. Fortunately, we don't have that now, but I mean, yeah. within, within two years, basically, or three years, I mean, three assassinations like that. So is that, to link this back to the big tech part, 
I mean, is that because this is all fueled by information that's just traveling? I think, I think at a, a combination. At so you, you've got big tech, and at the same time, you now, where do you go to get your news? You don't get your news, you get opinion. I go to Twitter. You go to, you, yeah, okay. But if you go to watch television tonight, you can watch a station that philosophically agrees with you. Yeah. That's going to give you opinion. Are they going to tell you the positive things, or are they going to rile you up? Then you're going to go to Twitter, and people are, it's human nature that you can attack somebody you don't know. You can, and you can repeat something that's not true, and you can mobilize something like that. Right? That's what other countries do to us. They try to divide us within their right? What, what, what was the Soviet Union's idea? To, de to destroy America with no shot mm. being fired, right? Do a Twitter bot. Yeah, this is what technology has done to us. But what's happened is, if you look at the four biggest technology, right? If you look at uh, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Instagram. Well, they're not four, they're two, right? So they can control what's thought, what's said, what's motivated, what's popular, how to move something at a given time. That becomes a problem. What do we value, right? Do you value fame? Or do you value the ability of success? I mean. Anyone who has a job has worth, has a sense of worth. And what is big, what's big government done? Tell you, no, 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 you don't need to work. Mm -hmm. No, no, we'll pay you to not do that. It takes a sense of worth away from you. And then someone goes and puts all their risk into something. I mean, I started my first business when I was 20 years old. Right? So I, I actually won the lottery in California on the second day. It was before lottery. I, I was... Um, I was flipping cars to pay my way through college. I was going to go to San Diego State to visit some friends at college, right? So I go to the local grocery store to cash a check. You tell how wealthy I am. So I'm sitting in line. The lottery started the day before, so I'm buying a oh, ticket. Oh, you mean this literally? I thought no, this is a true story. No, no. I said I won the lottery. Like, yeah. I lived in California. I was young. Okay. So I tell my buddy. Yeah. I said, I'm, I'm going to say, if I win, I'll give you 100 bucks. I buy a ticket. I scratch off. I win. The most you can win is $5,000. Put yourself in my place, right? You're 20 years old. It's 1985. It's Friday night. You just won $5,000, and you end up 10 minutes from Tijuana, right? Okay. Uh-oh. So I come back. I take my folks to dinner. My brother orders dessert to make the price higher. I give them both Wait, did they, at the time, did they cash it out right there? I took it to the lottery store, and then they sent me a check like a week or two later. Yeah. Right? 5000 bucks, the yeah. full amount, right? So then I went. I took the, kind of the majority of the rest of the money I have. I put it all in one stock because I want to take, take a risk. I made about 30% of my money in six weeks, okay? So I want to buy a franchise, but no one will sell me one because I'm 20 years old. So I go and I open this deli. I even built a counter in my dad's garage. Yeah. And there's three lessons I learned from my small business. I was the first to work, I was last to leave, I was last to be paid. But you know what? Pretty successful, about a year and a half afterwards, I now have enough capital that I could pay my whole way through college as long as I go to Cal State, right? Wow. No one in my family had finished a four-year degree, so I sell my business. Going to school, open up the paper, it says be a summer intern in Washington, D.C. with my local congressman. Don't know him, but think he'd be lucky to have me. I apply, and you know what he did? He turned me down. You want to know the end of the story? I now sit in the congressional seat I couldn't get an internship for. Wow. Only in America could that happen. Yeah. Right? So how can it happen again today if government will pay you more instead of go work for the small business starting out? Or if you took all that risk and opened it up and they put you under. Is that what this They're really... They're picking winners and losers. So is that what this really is all about? Like this whole conversation, almost everything wrong with the country? Because I'm hearing you say that and it's like, man, that's what America is about. That's what life is about. Purpose and risk and, you know, all of those things. And now we have a government... I mean, taking just, it all away. Just, just this morning, right before you walked in, I saw this tweet by Biden and it was like, we're going to expand child health care from the state and we're going to expand two-year college and all. And it's exactly what you're saying about Venezuela. Like, where would you, if you ever wanted to brainwash a generation, wouldn't you just keep sending them to state schools and say, be more and more reliant on us? Yes. I mean, to me, this is what it's all about, more than, more than the big tech part in a way and everything else. Just the expansion of, we'll do everything for you. You know what's great is uh, Richard Branson is going to go to space, privately. Yeah. You know, it, Americans take risk. That's what sets us apart, because we accept risk. Do we want more attorneys or more engineers, right? An attorney, attorney wants to eliminate risk to have you do nothing, right? They want government to do everything for you. Everybody has an opportunity. We want to give them all an opportunity to start. But what you do once you're 18, the outcome's not going to be the same. But the Democrats believe everybody's outcome is going to be the same. No. 
That doesn't work. I want you to be successful as you can, but I want you to have the same ability to be able to be successful. So be able to take the risk. And if I take the risk and I get reward, I don't want government taking it all. But are you shocked that they've moved on this equity thing instead of equality? That now that it's, it's about the result, not you know, the end spot, instead of all you know the years you know of work to get there? So we don't have what is called a State of the Union in your first term. It is a, it was a joint, joint chambers um, we had, and we had the president come. And so you go back and you go. Oh, I like that. You, you're doing a 10 minute correction on me there. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, I, <laughs> that was very, but that's a, that was but very that's, subtle what you did there. It no, wasn't no, no. a state of the union. So it was joint session of Congress, but in the first year, it's technically not yeah, a state of the union. Yeah, it's not a state of the union because it just uh, came in. Yeah, but, that but was anyways. interesting. You, you didn't call me out originally, then you slid it in there. Very impressive. All right. But, but an interesting point. So as leader, I'm, I'm part of an escort committee. So you go back and you greet the president, who's ever president's time. And so at this time, we're coming out, we've got our masks on, right? And in there is Bernie Sanders. And I disagree with Bernie, but I respect Bernie. He believes what he believes, right? He doesn't back away from it. He's, he's not going to go down in history as passing any legislation, but he's a movement politician, right? I see Bernie against the wall, and I just talk to President Biden. I come out, I say to Bernie, think about this. Bernie is the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. He's a socialist, but he's right. chair of Senate Budget But he never backed away. He ran as a socialist, right? Yeah. So I said to him, did you ever think you'd be more conservative than the President of the United States? And he kind of looks at me and kind of laughs, but it's true. All that stuff you just brought up, Biden right, has Biden's moved. Right, Biden's doing it. Yeah. Yes. Biden literally, and I believe most people who become president try to model themselves after a former president. Biden is trying to model himself after FDR. And think about all that stuff, the challenge of what FDR did in that place. It packed the courts, right? And this is what the Democrats will do. They'll, they'll do a commission because it's not packing the courts. And the commission will come back. Watch, this will be my prediction. The commission will come back and say, you cannot be a judge after the age of 67 or something, right? They'll pick an age. Mm -hmm. Why will do that? Because they'll make automatically all these people retire so they can pack the courts. Yeah. And what he's trying to do, he doesn't They love really commissions, though, don't they? They love commissions and hearings. That must drive you nuts. <laughs> like, it's, it's like a functional person to be in government. Another commission and another hearing and another investigation. It's like, is anyone doing work around here? You know, like actual work? You should be. But you, you be. know what else has happened? This is what people don't grab. Structure dictates behavior. If you look at your Congress, something has happened that's never happened before. No matter what challenge we've ever had in this country, you vote by proxy. You don't have to show up. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean when you vote by proxy? Well, there, there are members in the Democratic Party that have never come back to Congress. But they still vote. Who has a vote? Pelosi has a vote. So you're not going to vote in committee. Committee is where you try to work out, where you get challenged. No, 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 no. I'm just going to bring the bill to the floor. And I'm, I've got all the votes I need, so I don't need to listen to anybody else. That's why you're getting this chaotic stuff. D do they even have to give Pelosi uh, an up or down, or she can basically decide? No, no, at they, that give, point. they give it to so her. So they have to give it to her, but, but you're saying because they're not physically there. They're not there, they're, they're not debating. They're, yeah. They still get paid. It's the only place in America you get paid, don't have to show up to work. Yeah, yeah. It's a great gig. My pinned tweet for almost all the lockdown was, if you cut politician salaries until the country opens up, it would be over in two minutes. I mean, <laughs> right? Like, these but, people got paid while they shut us all down. You know, through yellow fever, through the Civil War, through World War I, through World War II, we all met. It would be important. If, do you think the founders would really think if there was a real challenge? Make sure the people at the grocery store go to work. Make sure the doctors go to work. Make sure the nurses. But you elected officials, no, you go home. You, yeah. you go protect yourself. <laughs> no, you should lead the nation. You should be at work. No, no, they don't do it. But it empowers her to be more powerful. I mean, that's not good government. I mean, didn't we leave the king? You, why are we creating a new one? W what year were you first voted in? 2006. So 2006, so 15 years ago. Does it... See, in, in the functional sense, not just sort of optically, does it seem that much worse in terms of being able to do anything right now? You know what I mean? Not just on the optic side, but like the real ability. If you really were trying to make something happen, sit down with these guys, try to do something. I mean that at the California yes. level and at the federal level. Yes. But it's not the worst it's ever been. But is it bad? Yes. And I do believe that's through leadership, right? Think about for one moment. If, if you sat back and, and you read in historical manner and you said, okay, Joe Biden won a presidency, but it was a close election. The Senate ended up 50-50, and the House was the smallest margin that the Democrats had in 100 years. Oh, I bet you had a check and balance. I, I bet you had to find common ground. No, you would think it's 2009 again that the Democrats 
have 60 votes in the Senate and a 40-seat majority in the House. They're just ramrodding things through, and then they're asking for $6 trillion, mm -hmm. which any economist will tell you is the backwards thing to do today. On the money, yeah, so on the budgets and all that, when they just, okay, we're going to tax these guys, we're going to spend this, that. Like, when you get these documents, when they hand it to you, they show you the big, you know, we all see the big thing of paper, and Rand Paul goes when through it, it on Festivus. When do you get it? You get it five minutes before, <laughs> usually, right? But, like, when, when they show you these numbers, like, are, in your head, are you like, what, what are these people talking about? You know what I mean? Like, wh what are these numbers? It's just, the, I think the average person at this point, they hear about all this stuff, seven trillion, and everyone's just like, it's just made up. It's monopoly money. Because it, it's true. I sit in the room, because I'm leader, at, where I have across the room with Pelosi, with Schumer, Secretary of Treasury, and I want to pull my hair out. There, there's no basis when you say, oh, it's based on science, it's based on facts. No, no, they just pick a number. I have to have this, otherwise you can't do it. What, what are you talking about? I mean, it, it, it is the most frustrating so thing. So how do you, in, like, give me like what a negotiation is like with that. When, they, when they're trying to pass something, okay, they pick their crazy number. What uh, do you do? Because you, know you know that their starting number is... Okay, let, yeah. me give you, let me give you a recent personal conversation. Yeah. So I go to the Oval Office, first time seeing the president, it's been 100 days. Um, so president, vice president, four leaders. President asks, can we do a bipartisan infrastructure bill? Okay. Some others speak and they go, Mr. President, you ask me, let, let me ask you a question. So the first question is, can we do a bipartisan? The answer is yes, we can. Well, how much money can you spend on it? I said, no, Mr. President, that's the wrong question. If you're asking my opinion, you ask, can we, would we work with you to do a bipartisan? The answer is yes. Now, what I would think of how to do that, how do you put the structure together, the first thing is we should both sit down and agree what is infrastructure. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. that was the thing online. How do you define infrastructure? So if it's roads, bridges, airports, broadband, yeah. let's decide what infrastructure is, and then we can see what is the need. Then you could decide what's it cost. Now, we have these trillions of dollars over here that we appropriated that now you don't need based upon COVID, why spend more money? Why don't you utilize those? But if you're asking me what I think bipartisan would be too, we would need some NEPA reform because some of the biggest challenges you know, you'd say build a road, but it's 10 years later before it gets built, mm -hmm. even though it's on the same road you're going to be. So let's reform that so things happen right away. Because look, the two greatest threats to America are China and the debt. The debt is going to give you fewer options of what you can do in the future. China spends the time just studying America, either stealing from us. Um, they have a plan for 2049, one world power. Um, you watch what President Xi has said. Uh, you watch what they have done with their military. You watch what they've done with their islands. You watch what they've done with Hong Kong. You watch what they're saying about Taiwan. Um, and we should be focused. And it shouldn't be a Republican plan or Democrat. It should be a one American plan. So if the next century is going to be American century, Let's work on it together. And infrastructure would be one of them. But you know what happened? Even when people came together and made a bipartisan plan, the first thing the president, we have a bipartisan plan, in the same day said, but I still need $6 trillion. So why would you ever work an agreement with them again? So who, who's driving the Biden thing? I mean, do, do you really think he's in charge? I know you don't want me to ask you this question, but do you, <laughs> do you honestly think that this guy's in charge? Look, uh, when I sat with him, the president is there. He's there. Is he slower and, and not the person that I knew as a vice president? Yeah. But I have a real concern that it's not engaging, right? I'll give you an example. You can disagree with Trump. Within the first three days, he had bipartisan, bicameral, all sitting at the table. He would, en I watch the engagement all the time. And, and it's not just who the president is, the people around have to be willing to engage. Speaker Pelosi normally always wants a bill just to be one party. Those are usually the worst outcomes you could have. You, you got to find common ground, and both people are going to have to get So it should go through a committee. You create a structure to make that happen, and it'll work. Um, right now, the Democrats pretty much want to have it a one-way street, and it's the progressives that are driving that. They would have to say to them, no, you're not going to do it. I'm going to make this agreement. And look it. If you're president and I say you just got elected, you've got this power, but if you're not going to use it, you're going to lose it. What are you willing to fight for? 
What are you willing to put your risk on the line for? What are you willing to go out and say? What are you willing to tell the American public both sides are wrong, this is where we need to go? Because I think in this country, we might be divided, but we want to be united. But he's pretty much given them what they want, right? Oh, totally. I he, mean, have you seen him push back on anything? further to the anything? left. No, he's right. further to the left than, than... Well, that's your Bernie point. Yeah, but you know what? We shouldn't be shocked by that. Because remember what Barack Obama said during the campaign? There is no difference between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. But this is a thing we should be afraid about. He also said that he'd like to have a third term where somebody else is president. You might have that right now. What do you think? He's got a lot of people in there. He's got a, he's got a lot of influence. Um, how people handle crisis tells you a lot, right? No one's perfect. Everybody stumbles. You most of, if you write an autobiography, the times you failed will be the most interesting part of the book. If you quit when you fail, that's the end of the chapter. If you pick yourself up, that's the American story. That's why we buy the book, right? So the president creates a crisis at the border, not because we did anything, simply because if a historian wrote, if Joe Biden became president and literally did nothing and kept the policies of the past administration, we'd be stronger in America today, mm -hmm. right? But he made these executive orders simply because he wanted to go the opposite of Trump. He stopped the wall from being built the moment he was sworn in, right? So you have these gaps. You, you, have, a, you have a gate in California because of his executive order that opened up, the mechanism broke, and they can't fix it, so they put a truck there to try to stop. I mean, it, it's archaic what they're doing. How did he handle it? He first spent the first month with Jen as press secretary. It's not a crisis. It's not a crisis. We're setting new records. We're catching people who are on the terrorist watch list. We had a 300% increase in drugs that are coming across that are killing people, right? The kids in cages aren't kids in cages no, anymore. No, they're not anymore, they're right? Not anymore. Because we've got a different person. Yeah. Um, fentanyl, right? Yeah. But you literally caught people from Yemen. Not on the same day. Why are they coming? Who are they talking to? What do they have planned? But it's not a crisis. You set new records more than 20 years. And then when it comes a point that the public understands it's a crisis, what does he do? Vice president's in charge. So what happens if China becomes a crisis? Putin, I'm going to go meet with Putin. I'm going to be I told Putin. I won't stand with him in a press conference. I've got to go one-on-one. -on -one. I've got to do my own. But I told Putin, don't you come after these, what, 12 or 16 yeah. different things? But you come after everything else. Then he does. What does he do? I'm getting tough. I'm going to buy an ice cream, and Putin's not going to do this. Yeah. He's done nothing. Anybody who becomes president, what's the first thing your adversaries do? They test they you. They test you, yeah. That's I mean, my fear. Is, the, is that 12 list, he had this list, I mean, for people that don't know what you're talking to, it was like 12 or 15 things yeah. that he said, Putin, you can't do these things. Like, I mean, that almost sounds like the dumbest, like that is idiocracy 101. These are the things we don't want you to do. Everything else you're good to go and actually, we know if you do these things. It's, prob what it's probably think? okay too, right? What do you think Putin thinks? A KGB. He looks at him and thinks, okay, <laughs> I don't do those 16, but I'll do these one trillion. Right, I'm going to do a whole bunch of other stuff. I kept my word. I mean, that's exact. Anyway, remember, Bush tells a funny story. How Putin thinks of everything in black and white, right? Like, remember President Bush had this dog, Barney. And he, and he takes Putin to Kenny Bunkport. He never took any other world leader there, right? And, Put and Bush made this statement, like, I looked into his heart, you know. He's yeah, yeah, the, Remember, the Soviet Union yeah. collapsed, Russia's there, right? So he's trying to help him. And um, Barney's there, and he sees Barney. So later, Bush goes to one of the summer homes of Putin, and they're having a summit. Putin says to him, you want to meet my dog? She loves dogs, yeah. Putin whistles, and out comes this big hound running. You know what Putin says? Look, bigger, stronger, faster. Than Barney. He thinks in black and white. So when you told Putin, don't go these few little things, he looks like I can do everything else. I mean, his one goal in life is to try to put the Soviet Union back together again. Then you got China. And what did, what did they do? They want to break the dollar, right? So they make an agreement with, with Iran. He does, Biden takes over. He does military operations. Then what does Joe Biden tell Putin? I'm going to send warships to the Middle East because you just built up these thousands of people across Ukraine. Then Biden backs away with the warship. Well, they think that's your judgment, right? 
What did President Trump do when he was tested the first time? He dropped that crazy bomb. Yeah, but how did, how, how did he tell President Xi of China? Here's some chocolate cake. Yeah. And mar lago Hey, right. by the way, there's 53 cruise missiles heading right now. You know? Obama puts a, puts a red line in Syria, but he allows him to cross it 12 times. Yeah. It, that's the challenge and the fear that I have. So, all right, so let's do a little bit more on China, and then I got one other thing sure. for you. So, all right, so on the China front, I mean, you know, it's funny because your, your demeanor is, is pretty smiley and friendly and positive, obviously. I'm a happy conservative. You, <laughs> wait, but I thought conservatives were all scary and mean and only care about war and money. Um, but despite, but you're saying some pretty scary stuff, actually. Like, it does seem, I think most people think at this point, that China is ahead of us. Like, something is wrong here, and China's just watching us destroy ourselves, destroy the dollar, the leadership is unclear, all that stuff. Like, is there a chance that they're not in charge in 2049? I mean, do you really see some situation yes, where we're the a, world? Yeah, like, it's not just a chance. I mean, come on. All right, happy conservative, bring it. Okay. Every company in China is a communist country company. You have to. President Xi is a head of the party, but head of the military, puts himself in the Constitution. That's not, that's not an opportunity to really have the best form of government. People crave freedom, right? 32 years ago, a million people in China went to Tiananmen Square. What'd they build? The goddess of democracy. what did it look like? Statue, Statue of Liberty. Liberty yeah. Where'd they put it? Directly across from Mao. What China do? They rolled tanks in. We all remember that one guy stood in front of the tank. He watched the video, stands in front of the tank. That's tank goes right, he moves right. Tank goes left, he moves left. The tank stops, he jumps on the tank. Do you know his name? No. Nobody knows his name. Because he's probably not alive. But had that person been a few years earlier, and it was in the Eastern Bloc when the Soviet Union collapsed, it would have been Vakfluenza, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Those people went to Tiananmen Square square because they craved freedom of speech, right? The thing you have to understand, America is more than a country. We're an idea. And that idea is more powerful than anything else around. Look, there are points in our history where other people were stronger. When I was in graduate school, an MBA, I did, would do SWOT analysis. Strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Let's start with our strength. Who's the largest economy in the world? We are. What's the dominant currency? The dollar. Who has the greatest military at any given time in the face of the earth? We do. Do we draft people? No. No. They volunteer to risk their own lives for you and I, right? When you go around the Horn of Africa and the pirates come in and take you hostage, who comes to save you? The Navy SEALs, right? When you have a challenge how many countries have aircraft carriers? No other country has more than two but us, right? But they're building, they're trying to gain us. If you live in another nation and you're sick, where do you want to go for your health care? America. If you live in another country, you live in China and you have wealth, where do you send your children to go to school? America, okay? So where are people breaking the law to get into? America. Nobody's leaving. Nobody's, Nobody's leaving. leaving, okay? Yeah. So, we start with a great deal amount of strength. But we also have a system that allows disruptors to come, so we improve constantly. In China, they have a small group that decides. They take you off an app. They, you get too big for them, they collapse. The greatest death rate of any billionaire is in China. Right? They, don't like well, they, they go take, missing. They, take they go out. missing. Yeah. But this is our challenge. China has spent their time <clears throat> studying America in every aspect, from stealing from us, from growth of food and others. But they also watched how we fought war. Okay. They watched Desert Storm. They watched it. America could move an aircraft carrier 250 miles away from anybody and come in and bomb you. Right. So what they spend their time on? Building aircraft carriers now, but they spent their time on building a missile to sink an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. They watch our men and women, the troops don't fight by just getting on land, they fight by space. So they spend a lot of time in space. Yeah. Do you know the other day, China sent three astronauts to space? Did they go to the International Space Station? Mm -mm. They went to the Chinese Space Station. They don't play with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Do you know China's landed on the moon? 
on the back side of the moon, the dark side of the moon. It's hard to land there. We haven't landed there. China realizes our aircraft carriers. So what do they do? They built the islands. What did they do when Barack Obama, Obama asked them about them? We won't weaponize them. She said that. But what did he do? He weaponized them to push us further away. The only time our aircraft carriers in recent history were not in the strait there was during COVID. Now, can we win? <laughs> I was going to say, you know, this, the question the is about is can yes. we win? Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. Is there a window and opportunity, just like you started with can, California, can we win here? I just created eight pillars to China based upon COVID. If there's any moment in time to wake up, to study, right? For the rest of the world to unite. Once China found they had COVID, what'd they do? They stopped flights. Not international flights, domestic flights. Mm -hmm. Then they dominated the World Health Organization to lie to the rest of the world. They hoarded PPE. Then, as it went forward and the rest of the world had it, what did they do? Well, they controlled so much mechanism what they built. When, when France needed PPE, even though they sent free to China, China says, we'll sell you some, yeah. but you have to have Huawei with you. They utilized COVID to get more gain within their own technology around the world. When Australia said they wanted to study where COVID came from, they went and put sanctions, tried to hurt them economically. They said the first place their nuclear weapon could hit would be Australia. They tried to intimidate what you would do. So what America should do is actually lead, would come from strength. We should declassify the information so the entire world should know why did three million people in the world die? And did they need to die? Why did 600,000 Americans die? Why did they, why did we have to in the process of COVID? The next thing I would do is end any gain of function research. And end it from this aspect. Don't give a grant to somebody else because you're going around saying my government's not giving to China, but I give to you because you give to China, right? Can, can you just explain what that is very quickly? Gain of function is what you take fr from a mechanism that this didn't come from oh, somebody ate a bat, right? right? They were trying to mechanize it and change it, and they were studying it in the process. So meaning us, humans, scientists are doing this. This isn't that a bat and a monkey did it, and here we are, yeah. Mm -mm. And do we put funding into it? Well, apparently for a long time we said we didn't, but we're finding out now we probably did. Make sure the NIH, which I love, doesn't provide grants that go to North Korea, Iran. Why do we help fund our enemies, okay? Then why don't we do this? Why don't we start looking at who we're providing our visas to. How many times have we found somebody from China's over here on a visa but actually belongs to their military? How many times have we catch them on a plane that they are stealing documents? How many times have we found out that they're funding the professor at the university? Didn't Swalwell sleep with a Chinese spy or something? I mean... Yes. <laughs> Why? Okay, that's a good question. I, I, I want to finish my eight pillars. Yeah. But, let, but let's yeah, talk about yeah, this. For the rest of the world, yeah. when you get to Congress, Republicans and Democrats decide what committees you get. But there are a couple committees that are totally different. They're decided by groups and they're voted on, right? Intel committee is different than any other committee because members who serve on Intel can only serve for a certain amount of time, but they find out information all the other members can't have, okay? They're only selected by their leaders. I select all the Republicans, Pelosi select all the Democrats. I am part of what is called the Gang of Eight, right? The leaders and the, leader and the leaders in Intel. We're provided information, a lot of other people aren't, right? To know what's going on. So I can't talk to you about things I know, but on the Intel Committee, this is all public domain we can talk about. What we know publicly, a Chinese spy, and also remember, Senator Feinstein, we found out later, the driver of more than 10 years was a Chinese spy in Silicon Valley. They've been in pictures together. This woman, a Chinese spy, creates a relationship with Swalwell when he's in the city council. He runs for Congress. She helps. She puts interns in his office. Do you know how difficult it is to get on the Intel Committee? When Swabble was put on the Intel Committee, they were in the minority, so they had some fewer seats. He was a sophomore getting put on the Intel Committee? Every single member asked me for the Intel Committee. Mm -hmm. There's very few openings, right? There's people highly qualified, there's just not openings for them. Gets put on. It's not then the public says that the FBI came to warn, right? They warned the leaders. They had a briefing. He's kept on the intel committee. 
this woman. They were warning them that there was a spy, basically, right? Yeah. I, wa I wonder how they knew she was a spy, right? She wasn't just spy, and then you had a mayor and other parts. Think about how big your spy mechanism must be if you have enough money to have a spy that cares about you when you're in the city council. Or talks about you getting uh, right, to there, Congress. There's right? some real planning they involved here. put a long term, yeah. I mean, Manchurian candidate. Remember, yeah. Swalwell ran for president. The only thing he has left is a bunch of shoelaces or something. Yeah. But I don't know. He spent the most money on that. But anyways, now you know this. You put them on, you did not know. Now you know as a leader. Okay, if Swalwell was in the private sector, he could not get a security clearance because he had a relationship with a spy. But only in America can he be given the intel committee where he knows all the secrets. But there's 200 other Democrats who are qualified to be on that slot, and she keeps appointing. I become but, but is that, wait, sorry, but is that also because they know damn well that the media is never going to call him out on it? Instead, it's, oh, Trump Jr. had lunch with somebody seven years ago. Can on you the believe that? Side. Yeah. 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 But, but that's part of it, right? That they can well, what was keep Hunter doing Biden this nonsense. Doing? <laughs> we're not, well, I guess we're allowed to talk about that on YouTube now. But, but oh yeah, you, you, you probably, oh, you, this is probably yeah, never gonna show. Yeah, well, you this will never show. You probably, <laughs> don't worry, I got locals.com and it can all go there. Okay, but I become leader. I'd never heard about this, right? Because the FBI comes and just provides it to a select few people on Intel. So I ask for a briefing. Speaker, Speaker Pelosi comes and has this briefing with me. What I know with what the FBI told me he should never be on Intel. And Pelosi reappointed him to Intel. I don't understand this. Did you, have you said this to her? Yes. <laughs> what, I what brought, she, what I, she but this is worse. I brought a motion to the floor to remove him from Intel, put another Democrat on. The Democrats all defended. They don't even have the briefing from the FBI, but they defended him having on. And think about this. He cannot get a security clearance in the private sector, but they voted to let him have the security clearance of American secrets. Okay, so when you say that to Nancy, when you say, Nancy, we got a problem here, there's a spy, et cetera, et cetera. Nancy, just me and you in the room right now, what does she say? She handles her own members. But you know what they did too? They went and removed Marjorie Greene yeah. for something yeah, yeah. Marjorie Greene said before she was a member of Congress. Right, as if they don't make Nazi references every two seconds, these Crazy. people. Yeah, all right, so let's get to the rest of those pillars. And then, oh, and then, yeah, yeah. And then I'll you, let you, you get to the right. business okay. of government. Okay, so the yeah. other thing we should look at is, yeah. after 9-11, we changed the sovereign laws that American, if they got killed, they could sue Saudi Arabia, right? You got court, you're in court. Why wouldn't we do that to allow the 600,000 who have died, their family, to sue China, to be able to get accountability? Do you know where the next Winter Olympics is going to be held? It's China, right? 2020. Why would 20, the world, why would the world, yeah. no, it's, no. 2024? Yeah, it's coming yeah. up quick. Yeah. Why would, is it 22? I, I know. I, I think, think it's it might, 22, I think it's 22 Wh or 24, yeah. yeah. Why would the world reward China? Why wouldn't we move the Olympics? Why? And, I mean, why wouldn't we hold, hold them accountable? Why, after COVID goes through, kills more than 3 million people, why does China get stronger and the rest of the world have to be weaker? Why wouldn't we unite? Why wouldn't this be the opening? Why wouldn't this be the wake-up call? Why wouldn't the rest of the country sit back and say, whoa, I didn't see what's going to happen. So when you promised, the first time I ever went to China was in 1995, and there was a sign in um, Tiananmen Square. It was the number of days and number of minutes to Hong Kong came under control. Okay? It was like a year away. And um, when, they, when Hong Kong switched, when the UK, they signed a document for 50 years. What did they do when COVID hit? They took it over. The Apple, the Apple Daily there, the newspaper for 26 years, now shut it's down. Now down yeah. yeah. You get less freedom. Tiananmen Square, more cameras, less freedom. In China, if someone steals your purse, you'll find it in a minute. Not because they're good, good at detective work, it's because they have a camera on everyone. In China, if you're Chinese and you want to buy an airline ticket, if you have enough money, there's no guarantee you get the airline ticket. You know what guarantees whether you can buy the airline ticket? Your score. Everybody is scored. Social credit. Yes. Why is it that Google would work with China but not work with American military? Why is it that Nike considers themselves a Chinese company? Why does the NBA bend a knee? So the question is, can we win the next century? Yes. But will we? Will we have the will? Okay. When I watched what happened at COVID, 
it made me start thinking, you know, what, we, we all thought the world, put China in the WTO, the World Trade Organization, they'll become more democratic. No, they haven't, but they took every advantage. Mm -hmm. Why do they get special funding as a developing nation today? I mean, it's crazy. Why do they get this benefit? Why would we allow this? They're competing with us everywhere. They just put a military base in Africa. They want to find one in the Atlantic. This road belt system, they, they are like loan sharks where they take these countries and they give them billions of dollars they can't afford. They say, we'll build the infrastructure, but they lie to them. And they right. don't create any jobs because they bring the Chinese to build it. Then they say, you didn't pay it. I need to take it over. I need to put the military here to protect my infrastructure. I mean, they have a plan. You can read it. So I'm still not sure where your silver lining is. I mean, it, does, silver, it doesn't seem to me that the well, silver the lining is structured, make an efficient, structure right? dictates behavior. Freedom will always win out over communism. Over dictatorship. Oh, so you're, right? giving, you're giving me the long, the long game here, which is just that but the idea of freedom okay, is stronger okay, this than. This is different than the Soviet Union, right? The Soviet Union, we could we outspent them. We can't outspend China, right? Mm -hmm. But what should we do? For the same reasons we started the three communiques with China, to to do something about the Soviet Union. Why aren't we working a better relationship with India? They have a bigger population. They care about America. They love America. Mm -hmm. They love the idea of freedom. Modi what he's doing to build his nation, right? Why, why don't we start standing up for freedom around the world? If we take the American belief and we say when China tells us that you're going to make a new Top Gun again, but you can't have Taiwan on the back, mm -hmm. when you have John Cena say in Mandarin that he's a sorry because Taiwan's a country, that's when you're in trouble. But look at this. Okay, after COVID, we should really start and think our critical minerals, our others, right? Do we make medicine in America anymore? Are we too tied to China, the supply chain of what we developed? And we should think of a supply chain totally different. We should think of the supply chain in America. What, what is, when, when we started having problems with ventilators and others, what did we do? We, we went to our warehouses where government bought these ventilators. They sat there, and when you needed them 25 years later, they weren't ready. Yeah. So this is what we should do, modernize, right? We should go to companies, because the free market works. 3M builds masks, right? Let's say 3M, you build a million masks a year, okay? What the American government's going to do is you're going to build 1.1 million. We're going to buy 100,000. You're going to store them. You know what you're going to do the next year? You're going to put that, and you're going to sell that 100,000, you're going to make a new one, right? And we're going to go to all of our allies, and we're going to tell you, you can join in this too, right? So now you're going to have scale. So we're not going to have to offshore our business over to China. We're going to make them in America. We're going to find critical minerals that we're not going to let them dump so our businesses can't survive. So if they're tied, if we want to build an electric car, but they control the minerals, how are we going to do it? If we need to make a new weapon, but they control the minerals, we could get into conflict, but in 60 days, are we going to be in trouble because we can't supply ourselves again? It is a wake-up call for us that we rethink. It's the same point of maybe that we were before World War II and others, that, that, that we got complacent that we didn't think long term, we thought the world was harmony, right? Um, we should use the strength position we're in today for the idea of freedom. America has never gone to conquer another country for the sake of controlling it. We've only gone engagement for freedom, right? That's different than any other country around us. There's other people around the world that crave that same thing, that understand that we're more than a country, that we're an idea. So I think if I can sum that up, you're, you're hopeful because the, our ideas are right, their ideas are wrong. But, our but, structure but, but, is right. But yeah, our structure our is right. Our division is hurting us. Yeah. They're getting a benefit over our division, and we should wake up. I'll, I'll tell you another story. You have a lot of story. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we went to the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Very moving. And we did a Codell. And when I sat and walked those fields, and you look in France, and you, you look at those headstones, um, from a Star of David to, to a cross. But you look at the age, you look at the names. They must have just got into them and, and yeah. killed on that day, right? And you pause for a moment and think, what could we have done before to not let that happen, right? Let's, let's learn from our mistakes and not get to the point of there. Well, the challenge of what we watch with um, China doing and others why don't we have one policy about that? So I went to the Democrats and I said, let's create a committee or a task force. Equal number of Republicans, equal number of Democrats. It took me eight months. And you know what? They finally said yes. And then we narrowed it down to how many people could be on it. 
And we look at every aspect, right? So we have a plan. Uh, China has a plan, so why don't we have a plan? How, how do we make America, you know, from education, from economics, from everything? Um, we even brought the Washington Post reporter in, and he interviewed, because we're going to have that article written as soon as we announce it. The day before, you know what the Democrats did? They backed away. They never gave me a reason, but mm -hmm. part of the reason I believe they thought, because COVID had hit, that it'd give an advantage to Trump that we were doing something. That they put politics before country. Now, the one thing I will tell you, if, if, if we are successful enough to have the majority, and, I, and I, I'm, I have the privilege of being speaker, I'll create that. I moved forward and created a China task force. And two-thirds of every bill that we brought out was bipartisan. We need to plan for the next century. So that gets me to the last question, which is, is that, so you want to be majority leader? I mean, I think that's... Not probably. the majority leader, the speaker. Uh, sorry, the majority, <laughs> right, right, the speaker. That's right, the, the speaker, right, right, sorry. You want to be the speaker, obviously, meaning you want to have majority in Congress. Look, to be, to be yes. honest, my goal, my goal is not to be speaker. My, yeah. my goal is to make the next century the American century. To do that, I believe Republicans need to take the majority. I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen. If I become speaker, then that's good. But I don't have to be from that aspect. Yeah, but... To get to where you kind of think America's got to go, that would be a nice little little plan for Look you. Look at what's and happening then, in the streets. Defunding of the police. Yeah. Look what's happening economic inflation. We haven't seen these type of problems since the 70s, since the last time the Democrats had major control. So I guess then, well, I'll ask a bonus last question, which is this interview strikes me as very hopeful, actually, and we're not we're not getting you're a lot. Sure we're not getting a lot. Of, no. Well, I, I always tell people I'm a world-weary optimist. I'm an optimist because I don't think I could do this. It's probably similar to you. I don't think I could do what I do if I wasn't an optimist because I have to believe that we can make things better, right? But I'm also a realist. So the world's tough. All right, and, let, me, let me sum yeah. up that question. Yeah. Bring us with, home. With why you need to come to my office. Okay. Yes. In my conference room, I have the last painting. It's Washington crossing the Delaware. It's eight feet by 16 feet. You know, you know the yeah, painting, yeah, right? Yeah, I know the painting, yeah. You know when that took place, Chris... Christmas 1776, right? You know when it was painted? 1850, 1851. It wasn't painted. Wow, 75 years later. It wasn't painted by somebody who's there. There was no iPhone to take a picture. <laughs> and he wasn't even an American. He was a German immigrant who lived in America. You know why he painted it? Because he went back to Germany and he wanted Germany to have a revolution based upon the ideas of America. Now his talent was art. So he paints this painting and he gets it historically incorrect, okay? If you, look, if you look at the Delaware, it looks like the Rhine, but he's German, right? <laughs> he puts Washington in a rowboat with 13 people, 13 colonies, right? But Washington, historians will tell you, crossed in a Durham boat. He has Washington standing up in the middle of winter in a ceremonial uniform with his right. hand on his chest. Right. You look at Washington, my God, I bet that man has never lost a battle. But history tells us at that moment, he had never won. He'd only lost. Because okay? that was our first victory when we surprised the Hessians. Now, when you look at this painting, don't look at Washington. Look at who's in the boat. The second person, he's wearing a beret. He's Scottish. The person directly across from him in the green jacket, rowing in a cadence with him, is black. You come down in the middle of the boat. The person who looked like the strongest, rowing the hardest in the red is a woman. And in the very back is a Native American. Now, the second to last person is a farmer. And if you look at the farmer, there's a hand across his face. It's the hand of the 13th person nobody sees. You see, what Emmanuel was saying, this young artist, here we are, not a country, but an idea, having lost every battle, but willing to risk everything for the idea of freedom on what most people would say is our holiest of night. Here's a hand when you get it and join us. That's as true today as it was then. The water may still be rough. What we have in front of us may be different challenges than we've seen before. But if we're all in the boat together, rowing together from every walk of life, we will win because we are an exceptional country. Here's a hand. Well, let's join us. together. <laughs> Thank you. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.